Yeah, thank you. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about classical verification of quantum depths, and this is based on joint work with uh, Shihan Hong, who is a uh, UT Austin postdoc. Okay. Oops. And in this work, we try to no, we try to answer the following question: Can classical clients verify that a remote server has claimed quantum resources? So we also call it this as a certifying quantum resources of a remote server. So you may wonder, like, why do we need to consider this kind of question? So let's consider the following situation. So you are a classical client, and you know there's a remote server or some company like Google, uh, IBM, or some companies, they claim that they have a big quantum computers. And first, you may want to ask, okay, do you have 500 qubits and more than 100 quantum depths? Uh, to do some computation. And usually these companies, at, uh, uh, of course, like some startup companies like to do this is, they always say yes. Say, okay, I have that many like qubits and that many quantum depths to do however you want. And if you don't have any way to certify their claim, you can only say, okay, I will pay you for the quantum computers or you just reject you say, okay, I don't want to work with you. But if you really you are really interested in quantum computers, you will say, okay, I will pay you for the quantum computation. But sometimes the truth is that uh, they only have five, uh, sorry, 50 qubits and the 10 depths, but you never know because for most of the tests, they can just try to use supercomputer to you know, complete your test and you never know whether they have that many qubits. Sometimes if you are just a client, they want that you just want to complete your job, you will feel, okay, it's fine. But if you are you know, a quantum computer scientist, you really want to know the progress of building quantum computers. This is not a good situation, right? And uh, especially when we say we want to certify quantum resources, we really want to know whether we can have a protocol for certifying quantum depths. Okay, and so why do we care about quantum depths? So first, near-term quantum computers, we believe that we can have more than 100 qubits uh, yes, thing. And, uh, but all the gates, like each qubit, uh, the, the gates operate on each qubit are noisy. And we don't have a way to do photo quantum computing for that noise right now. And also because like for qubits, you only have a short coherence time. So this implies that each qubit, you can operate too many gates on it because you only have limited time to operate your depth, uh, operate your gates. And each gate have noise. If you operate too many, gates on one qubit, uh, the noise will accumulate it, and eventually your computation will be totally noisy. So it means that we only have small circuit depths. And for example, Google Supremacy experiment, they only have 53 qubits and only 20 depths, but this all already introduced like 99.8% of noise. And on the other hand, for general quantum computer, we believe that we can have arbitrarily many qubits, like polynomial many qubits. And, uh, each gate only have small noise, such that we can use photo-run quantum computing to, you know, to make the to make all the computations noiseless, and the coherence time can be like long enough. So in this way, we can, you know, we can implement arbitrary polynomial size like quantum, uh, quantum circuit, and this can do all polynomial time quantum algorithms. So we found that, okay, because of a constraint of near-term quantum computers, like the noise and the coherence time, building machine with large quantum depths is very, very challenging. So that's why we want the method to check quantum depths of a remote server. We want to make sure that uh, the remote server are trying to build in like quantum computers with large depths. <clears throat> okay. So we call this protocol classical verification of quantum depths, which is a protocol Try to you no know, try to check whether uh, you know, a remote server has large quantum depths. So here we need three requirements. The first requirement is that we want the classic the clients and the protocols are classical, because uh, I assume that so we will not have like quantum iPhone or like a quantum laptop soon in the future. So we may need to assume that we still use our classical computers to interact with a quantum server. So I hope this guy um, no, has class, is, uh, is a classical verifier and the all the interaction here, we don't need to use uh, no quantum resources or quantum messages to interact with the server. And second, of course, the goal of this protocol is try to identify the quantum depths, right? 
So we want to have the following scenario. So the surface, so we want to record, we want to like um, identify two cases. First, surface quantum depth is greater than D. And in this case, our verify or say the client will accept the protocol. And on the other hand, if the surface quantum depth is not strictly, uh, sorry, is smaller than D, then we want the verify to reject the server. So such that if this remote server don't have enough quantum depth, we can identify and we can say we don't want to work with you. And if it has enough you now quantum depth, then uh, the client should be able to accept. Okay, so that's the second requirement. And the third requirement is about the power of the uh, remote remote server, because we may need to assume that it can use some classical computation to cheat. And uh, we also need to assume that probably it has a small quantum circuit and a very powerful classical computer, and they can try to you know do hybrid quantum classical computation such that um, to pretend that it has a large quantum circuit. <clears throat> so this is the three requirements of the CVQD protocol. <clears throat> and uh, we talked about like hybrid quantum classical computer. We said that, okay, probably the remote server can use the quantum computer and the classical computer together to cheat or do some computation, right? So actually there are two models for the computation. I call the first one the DCQ scheme and the second one the DQC scheme. So the DCQ scheme you can consider as that uh, you have a classical computer like your laptop or your iPhone, and you can let this classical computer access a D-depth quantum circuit, okay? So like uh, it has a small server there, and then uh, it can do like D-depth quantum circuit. And then you're, uh, you can send some message to the, to the server and the server will, uh, will reply to you with some classical uh, quantum computation. So this is in this model. So C is the classical computer and U is the you know, quantum circuit. And then you do some computation on the quantum circuit and you measure the result and then send back the uh, information to the classical computer. And you can do this like many, many times. And how about the DQC scheme? So the DQC scheme is that the depth of a quantum computer is D depth, okay? But after each layer of, of uh, gates, you can measure part of your quantum computation and then do some classical computation on it and then send back the information to the next layer of uh, quantum circuit. But the total depth of the circuit needs to be D depth. So that's why I, here I wrote like U1, U2 to UD. Okay, so you can see that these two models are quite different. The first model is more like the variational quantum, compu uh, variational quantum computation model. So you can do classical computer, classical computation, and then use quantum circuit to do some simulation or or um, do some do something. And the second part is more like a measurement based quantum computation. So you do a layer of quantum circuit, and then you measure part of a result, and then you use that result to control the next layer of quantum circuit. So this is the two models about hybrid quantum hybrid quantum classical computation. Okay, so um. That's for like the first part of the talk, like the, the problem we want to do is the uh, classical verification of quantum depths. And we need to consider like we have these two kinds of uh, hybrid models the prover can be used, can used, um, you know, to solve our problem. So let's start from the first attempt for the CVQD protocols. <clears throat> so uh, actually our work is motivated by my previous research about separating, you know, quantum depths. So in 2020, we proved that there exists a problem called DSSP problem, such that if you have a D plus three depth quantum computer, uh, not interspersed with a classical computer, then you can solve the problem easily. But if you only have D depth quantum computer plus classical computer, you cannot solve this problem. So here I write like uh, D depth quantum circuit plus can Classical computer, which means that I used either DCQ scheme or DQC scheme with D depths, we cannot solve the problem. Okay. And this is a drain work with uh, Chin Lai and the timing trunk. And so here we okay, start from this problem. Essentially, this problem is very helpful for like for our goal. Try to build the first CVQD protocol. So the idea is very simple and straightforward. 
So the very first simply ask the remote server to solve the DSSP problem. Okay. So just ask, oh, can you solve the problem for me? And then if the server has a deep past three depths, then you can solve the problem, right? But if he only has like at most D depths, then it seems that he has no way to solve the problem because based on our theory, if you don't have sufficient depths, you cannot solve the problem. Okay, so you can catch him by asking this problem. So now we need to check, okay, whether this idea satisfy all the three requirements of the DBQD protocol. So first, it satisfies the second requirement. You can recognize server's quantum depths, right? Because if a server has quantum depth D prime here, which is the D plus three, then the verifier accepts. And if a server doesn't have enough circuit depths, then the verifier rejects because we can identify it. And second, even if the remote server has the class, can use class or computation to cheat, you know, uh, based on the soundness of the of the problem, um, you know, it can still not pass the test if it doesn't have enough uh, quantum depth. So it said it, so this idea satisfies the second and the third requirement. And uh, how about the first requirement? Are the verifier and the protocol classical? So here, so to understand to understand it, we need to you know open the bread bus and see the definition of the DSSP problem. So for DSSP problem, the input is actually a bunch of quantum oracles, F D row to F D. And you can view it as like some, you know, just some functions that encode the Simon's problem. You know, I assume that people here know Simon's problem. So which is a famous problem in quantum algorithms that only quantum computer can solve the problem and any podium and classical algorithms cannot solve the problem. Okay. And the goal is that you need to, given the quantum access to all these oracles, you need to solve the Simon's problem. Okay. So now let's try to see, okay, how do the verifier implement this problem uh, in a protocol? So first, the verifier needs to implement the quantum oracle F. Like here is a bunch of uh, functions, F0 to F D. Okay. And then he lets the, no, he or she lets the server runs the hybrid quantum, hybrid quantum classical algorithm. And because this is an Oracle problem, so the algorithm must ask the verifier or say the functions or the Oracles some queries say, okay, he wants to know F0 of S equal to what and the F1 of S equal to what. So you need to exchange quantum message and the quantum queries between the server and the client. Okay. So now some something happened because here you need to act, implement the quantum access to the Oracle F. So you need to use that quantum memory or QRAM, you know, to support the quantum access. And because like all the queries could be like quantum queries, so all the message exchange between the server and the client needs to be, you know, quantum message. So both are quantum. But remember that in our CVQD protocol, the requirement is that a client need to be classical and all the information exchange between the client and the server also need to be classical. So this idea doesn't satisfy the first requirement of the CVQD protocol. <laughs> okay. So in our work, we try to build a CVQD protocol inspired by this problem. So here is our first protocol. Theory one, uh, we show that there's a protocol A that can distinguish D depth quantum circuit from D plus C, pro, uh, C star for any D. Okay, so here C star is just some fixed uh, fixed constant. So uh, our, pro our protocol A is a classical verifying the classical protocol and it can recognize servers quantum depths, uh, D plus C star and the D. Okay, so the convenience means that if the server, uh, 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 honest server has sufficient depth, it can pass the test. And the soundness means that any dishonest server with, with uh, insufficient depth, it cannot pass the test, it will be rejected. And we also assume that a remote server can use classical computation to cheat. 
And uh, here is some remark about uh, this protocol. So first, the separation d versus d plus c star is not optimal because c star is some big constant or at least like uh, not 20 or 30 depths. So this is not optimal. So one thing is that you can try to improve it. And the second is that this c star or on this server needs to have at this c star to run the protocol. So this is kind of a you know, a stretch. Any quantum circuit without uh, with steps um, with steps less than c star cannot run the protocol. So this gives a like high bar for certifying near-term quantum computer. And other improvements are needed, and we will discuss later when we like uh, really go to the details about uh, this protocol A. But inspired by these remarks of protocol A, we also provide a protocol B. Uh, protocol B is like, it is a two-prover protocol. We will say what's that later. But the best, the good thing about the protocol B is that it can distinguish D depth quantum computer from D plus three for any D. And three is much less than, uh, is much less than the C star. Okay. So again, it is classical, verify and the classical protocol, and it can separate D plus three versus D. And also remote server can use classical computation to cheat. However, uh, for protocol B, B requires another dishonest quantum prover to help. So this is why I say it is a two prover protocol. And this is not, not, not very good in the, uh, in, in practice because another design is, uh, quantum server needs to have like full quantum power, but it gives us a better separation and the other benefit. We will talk about it later. <clears throat> So you can see that these two protocols, protocol A and the protocol B, they are you know, incomparable. And protocol A is, uh, you know, uh, so much more like uh, close to the real world, what we can implement in the real world. And protocol B, it is have a theoretical interest because like uh, it can provide almost optimal separation and there's some other benefits, but it is a two proof protocol. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about our protocol A and our protocol B. So for here, like any questions about, you know, about, about the talk right now? <clears throat> okay, no, so I can continue. <clears throat> okay, so for protocol A, the idea is try to, you know, combine the proof of quantumness protocol and the pointer chess. So let me first introduce a proof of Quentinist protocol. So this protocol is first introduced by uh, Brad Kursky, Cristiano, uh, Mahadev, Vesarani, and Vitek in 2018. So the goal is that the classical client to distinguish the following two cases. First case is a remote server has specific quantum power. And the second case, a remote server is purely classical. So it means that this guy is classical, all the messages are classical, and you can check whether the remote server is a classical computer or some quantum computer. Okay. And their protocol uh, is based on a harness, which we call the adaptive hardcore B. So for this, uh, for this property, which means that uh, from the learning with error assumption that quantum computer cannot solve this learning with error problem. They assume this uh, conjecture. Then there exists a two to one function f such that no efficient quantum person can output y x e such that f of n equal to y, oops, and the x zero plus x one uh, dot e equal to zero with probability greater than one half. So here x zero and x and x one. Uh, they are the pre-image of y for function f. Okay, so which means that um, you know uh, it is kind of like impossible to compute a two pre-image of one y. <clears throat> and another thing about this property is that after revealing y, for example, uh, I compute y, and then um, y of x or y of e can be efficiently computed by quantum algorithm. You can compute one of them but you cannot compute both of them. Okay, but you can choose which one you want to compute. So this is called the adaptive hardcore B property. And they use this prop uh, property to build a protocol, which we call the, here, the proof of quantum protocol. So the protocol, 
So let me tell you a little bit about the protocol. So the protocol start with the function f. So the verifier, the, the client first send the function f to the remote server. And the remote server computer superposition of x, f of x. So this is what you do in the Simon's problem or other like famous problems that we can have quantum advantages. And then after compute some major x, f of x, you just measure uh, the second register. Okay, and then you get this. So you get y and the x0 and the x1. So this is kind of like similar to the first, you know, uh, the first uh, the first thing about the AHB. So you have x0 here and the x1 here. And then uh, the remote server send back the y. So it's measurement of the second register. And the client at, uh, sent a bit, which is either zero or one. So if the client sends t equal to zero, so still you can view it as a challenge. So the challenge has two types, zero and one. So if we send a challenge as zero, it means that uh, the client wants the remote server to give uh, x zero or x one. So it's kind of like, um, you no, know, in in the B part, we want either y of x or y. So here you can send the x back. So you just measure the first register and you get x0 or x1. So you, you just send however you however you get in your measurement. And if it's equal to one, you can just make measure your s in the Hadama basis. And after some like uh, simple calculation, you can find that your measurement outcome will be some e such that e times x0 plus x1 equal to zero. So it satisfies the here satisfy this requirement. And then you can send back it. So in this way you can find that okay, a quantum remote server, it can no, it can it can pass a test because if it is equal to zero based on the second uh, based on the second item of the AHB, I can send X. And if it's equal to one, I can send E. Because after revealing Y, a quantum computer can choose which one to send. On the other hand, if a remote server is a classical computer, it cannot choose. So it can only, so when, when you reveal the Y to the verifier, you also, uh, you also need to determine which test he will try to, you know, pass. For example, if after sending Y and it got X, then the remote server, if the remote server send zero to the, uh, sorry, the client send zero to a remote server, then it's happy. Remote server uh, can pass a test. But if the client send one to the remote server, the remote server has no way to pass a test. So this proof of quantumness protocol can help the client and the remote server, uh, sorry, help the client to check whether the remote server is a quantum computer who can implement these computations or it is just a pure classical server. Okay. And so, so our idea of the first protocol is start from this proof of quantum protocol because you can view this proof of quantum protocol. It can distinguish uh, depth something and uh, depth zero, right? Because a depth zero quantum computer is just a no, it just has no quantum quantum computer. So it is just a purely classical computer. So so if you can distinguish a quantum computer and a classical computer, actually you do something about the uh, classical verification of quantum depths. But just a very like not a very fine grain separation. It's a very uh, rough separation. Okay. So here, uh, just some remark about the uh, proof of quantum protocol. So a classical first server who can win again, like he can he can make the client accept by just using classical power, then he can break the AHB property by rewinding, and if he can break the HB, it means that it can solve the LWE problem. And uh, in, in like in post-quantum cryptography, people usually assume that uh, LWE is secure against quantum computer. And of course you can see that here, uh, the most cost part, the most costly part is the implementing X F of X, right? Because here you need to do quantum circuit to implement the all local access to F. And uh, by Hirahara and the going, in 2021, and the Liu and the Joe, um, Joe Few in 2021, they show that actually for implementing F can be evaluated in depth, uh, in constant depth. 
So, which means that this protocol, if you use their result, it can separate depths, constant depths from you know, depth zero devices. Okay. And then we, uh, to get our CBQD protocol for beta separation, what we want to know is to separate PO, uh, no, it's not just, it's not just like deep, uh, deep, uh, not just like C star versus zero. We want to do something like D plus C star versus D. So we use another idea called pointer tracing uh, to for our goal. So pointer tracing, you can just view it you know, as idea that it can be viewed as a sequence of questions such that the next question is determined by the last answer. For example, I, if I want to no, if I want to get the third question, I need to first complete the answer of uh, I need to first answer the second question and the first question such that someone will reveal me the third question. So we use this idea to help us construct a protocol for CBQD. <clears throat> so the protocol is, uh, is like follows. So instead of just compute one F, we try to compute a bunch of F, say F1 to FD. So the client send F1 to FD to the remote server and remote server again, generate quantum states, summation uh, X, F1 of X, Summation x, f2 of x. So it generates a bunch of quantum, uh, quantum states. And then it measures the second register of each state. Okay, so it will get x01, x11, x0d, x1d, and the y1 to yd. And then the remote server send y1 and to yd back to the, you know, back to a client. And then the client do the following iteratively. So he first sends c1. So like the challenge to the remote, the first challenge to a remote server. So again, if C1 equal to zero, the remote server measure the uh, first register of the first state to get some X and then send it back. And if C1 equal to one, it measure X in Hadama basis and get E1 and then send E1 back to the, back to the client. And then after getting the, the answer to the first challenge, the the client uh, use some like some hash function and then put the answers to the hash function and then generate C2. Okay, C2 is a second challenge. So the second challenge depends on the answer of the first challenge. And then depends on the second challenge, the remote server needs to decide, the, okay, which, uh, which one I want to compute. And then so on and so on. Okay, so you can see that uh, here we use a pointer chasing pointer chasing idea such that remote server uh, can only no can only do one change at a time. So like all the other states after it generate in the from the first it, so here in the beginning it generate a bunch of state right, but all these they need to keep coherence until like all the challenges completed. Okay. So here is a remark, CI is de determined by the answer of the I minus one strong. Okay, and then let's go back to see the completeness on this software protocol. So for completeness, we said that there is a D plus C star quantum computer that can win again. So we need C star depth to evaluate this, uh, no, to generate this state, summation X, F of X. And we also know that I minus one's answer determine I's challenge. So the I's qubit keeps coherent until like all previous I minus one runs complete. For example, here, so you can answer this is the first run and uh, you measure it and then you send the result back to the classical client. And the client use a hash function to determine the result and then send it back, right? And then de determine, um, no, uh, determined by the, the, by the result here, you will have challenge zero or challenge one, and you determine whether you want to apply a Hadama gate here. And then according to it, you do some measurement, and then you send your answer to the challenge two back. And then uh, the challenge of the third challenge will determine by the answer of the second challenge. And then you keep doing this. So you can see that like here, the third, the third, uh, the third quantum states needs to wait until like all the previous computation completed. So the circuit depth is kind of like one, two, three, four, five. So the depth is five. 
So such that if the quantum computer don't have enough circuit depth, you know, it cannot wait until like all the computation being completed. So the idea is like, just the proof of something is like follows. So if I just have a deep prompt quantum computer, which depth is strictly smaller than D, then it cannot win the game by breaking AHB. So this is based on like the pigeon hole. I, I call it the pigeon hole principle idea. So we said that one quantum depth can only be used in one row based on the structure of the protocol. So if we said that the D prime depth versus D runs and D prime is three smaller than D, which means that there exist some runs that are executed classically. So which means that if I go to that round, actually everything uh, the server try to do in that round is purely classical. And then we can reduce the problem back to the proof of quantum needs and say, okay, if I have I have such a round, I can use it to break the proof of quantum needs. And then it can help us to break the AHB property and thus also the LWE assumption. So this is about soundness proof. So so such that we can see that okay, any quantum computers uh, which D prime is not sufficiently large, then it cannot pass a test. Okay, so let's uh, go back to the first uh, CVQD protocol and try to recap this protocol. So for this protocol, there is a CVQD. Uh, so we can separate quantum depth, uh, D plus D star and the D. Okay, and the, you know, everything satisfy the three requirements of the CVQD. However, there are some advantage. First, as we mentioned, it is D versus D plus D star. This is not optimal. And the other server needs to have like C star depth to implement protocol. And the third requirement is that the honest server needs to be able to implement a DQC scheme, which is kind of like this one. The, the one which is more closer to, is closer to the measurement based quantum computer, not a very rational quantum computer. And the, usually we believe that DQC scheme is like harder to be implemented than the, you know, DCQ scheme. So this is the disadvantage of this protocol. And next question, can we solve these issues, try to improve the protocol? So this gives us the protocol B. So we consider all the disadvantage of protocol A. And we found that protocol B can do this. So the protocol B can have a beta separation, D versus D plus three. And second, the honest server doesn't need to have any uh, you know, threshold, threshold to implement the protocol. And the third, uh, the honest proof, uh, the honest server, if he wants to solve the problem, um, he can just use arbitrary DDAP quantum circuit with some classical post process. It doesn't need to be a DQC scheme or DCQ scheme. We just run a, a DDAP quantum circuit and then you do some classical computation uh, at the end to, you know, to complete your task. So it seems that this is a better, you know, better protocol than the protocol A. You know, better separation and also easy to implement it. And the idea is that we try to revisit the first failed attempt, like the one we said about the DSSP problem and try to dequantize the protocol via non-local. So let's go back to our, our first approach. Say we have a DSSP problem and the classical client just asks, you know, the server to solve the DSSP problem. But the question is that for, uh, for that approach, the client and all the queries here are quantum. So how to make the verifier and the protocol classical? So the idea is that we can try to delegate a quantum computer to another server. So the protocol is like this. So you have server one and the server two, and then server one and server two, they can share some EPR pairs. But all the commun communication between client and the servers are classical. Okay. So first, server two implements the quantum oracle. So we said that because the DSSP, DSSP is an oracle problem, so we need someone to implement the quantum oracle. And uh, in the in in the first proposal, we said that okay, client implement the quantum oracle by itself. But here we just say okay the client let the server to implement the quantum oracle. And then server one and server two, they can share EPR pairs in the beginning, of course. And, but they cannot talk after the protocol starts. Okay. 
So you need to assume that the two servers are malicious and they want to cheat. They want to convince the verifier that the server one has sufficient depth. And um, the way that server one and server two to commute, because we still need to say that the server one wants to run the algorithm, but to run the algorithm, it needs to query the quantum oracle. But as we said, server one and server two, they cannot talk after the protocol starts. So the way they talk is actually the server one teleports the queries to server two. But to do quantum teleportation, you need to send classical message from server one to server two, right? Although they cannot communicate directly, but they can use client to commute, communicate. So the server one send a classical message to the, to the client and the client may do something about the message and then send it to the server two and the vice versa. So if they want to exchange classical messages, they can exchange it via the client. Okay, but of course you need to prevent the server and server two they you know, collaborate together to cheat. So the verifier need additional tests to catch a cheating servers. <clears throat> okay, so here let me just uh, briefly sketch the proof because the proof is a little bit more like more complicated than the previous one. So we start from broadband protocol for BQP. So this is a protocol that can certify whether a remote server really do some BQP computation. So here BQP means that we have some, lang some language, which is a decision problem that uh, the client wants to decide whether instance X is in the language L or not in the language L. So actually the client asks the following question, is X in L? And by using some you know, test and the quantum, quantum message is changed between the server and the client, you know, the verifier can, dis can know whether X is in L or not. So here in this protocol, there are three types of uh, computation. First, the client may just ask the remote server to compute X in L, or it will give X and C test. So these two tests are try to catch whether the remote server try to do some big flip or fast flip on the computation. And the best thing about this is that the, from the server's view, it cannot distinguish whether right now we are in the type one computation or in the X test or in the Z test. So it cannot distinguish whether the client is doing a test or a computation. So the best thing the server can do is just try to follow the follow uh, try to follow the verifier's instruction. Say, I want to do this, and you just do this. Because if you do something else, then you will be caged by X test or Z test. And then we found that, okay, this theory can be improved. You can, you can not just, you, you don't, uh, so it, it doesn't just compute uh, BQP, but you can actually ask the remote server to comp compute the arbitrary polynomial time quantum circuit C. So as I say here, for any efficient quantum circuit C, if a server win the game with high probability, it implements a channel C prom. And this C prom is very close to C. And again, we also use X test and Z test in broadband protocol to check if the entire output state has error. So in other words, if the client wants to compute a specific circuit C, not just a decision problem, you can also use the same protocol or a modified protocol. Uh, to compute it. But right now, like all the, com all the communication are still quantum. So we use another protocol called the Verify on a Leash protocol by Corodengo, Grillo, Jury, and uh, Vidic in 2019. They shows that uh, we apply it and then we show that, okay, server one wants to compute some algorithm C. And then they can use this two proof structure to compute it. And as I said, like all the message between clients and the server are classical. And the server and server two leg can be dishonest, but they need to share some API pairs, pairs and they cannot talk after a protocol starts. <clears throat> okay. So now you can see that, okay, Based on our, so I, we use that protocol, like our protocol plus verify on leash by VTK. Oh, we use that protocol. We can somehow let the classical client ask the server one to do the algorithm for the DSSP problem and also ask the server two, you know, to implement the Oracle. 
and the verifier use a digital test to catch a cheating server. So which means that then the X test and Z test and other tests, if these two servers uh not not doing the the right thing, then we can catch it. Okay. So and let's give a recap of the of the second protocol, protocol B. So the protocol B is kind of like um it's quite different from protocol one. So protocol B, protocol A, so protocol B is a two proof protocol, right? Of course, this protocol gives a uh, you know almost optimal separation, D plus D versus D. And I think it is kind of like hard to get a better separation. And the best thing, the best thing about the protocol B is that it is unconditionally secure. You don't need any you know, computational assumption. And it can give you a nearly optimal separate. Uh, it can give you an un unconditional uh, security if you can allow the classical client to do some inefficient computation. Oops. Oh, wait, okay. <clears throat> Yeah, so here, unconditional secure and the nearly optimal separation. And, uh, but the, the main that disadvantage of protocol B is that protocol B requires another dishonest quantum prover you know, to help. So this is a little bit different from the original goal of the C, CBQD protocol. The CBQD protocol, what we want is that a classical client can certify the depths of a remote server by itself. But in protocol B, we need another one to help. It's kind of like if I want to certify Microsoft's quantum computer, I need Google's quantum computer to help me, something like that. So it's kind of like not very good in the real uh, not in the real world. Okay, so we can go to the open question. So here I list three open questions. So the first open question is that we still want some classical verification of quantum resources. So here we just talk about quantum depths, right? But we can have more. We can have like some protocol to certify quantum memory or even quantum volume or even fidelity and so on and so forth. So because right now we know that for some quantum resources, it's hard to get. Like if you want to have a large quantum computer without error, uh, you know, the, the fidelity is very important. And the fidelity, you know, influence affects the quantum, the, the size of the quantum memory and the size of the quantum depth. So if we can have some, you know, some way to certify fidelity, memory, depth, or volume, it is good. Like, uh, we can have a way to make sure that, uh, companies or even the labs that are trying to build quantum computers, uh, as we expected. And the second thing is that, the current CVQD protocol we propose, the, pro the two protocols, they cannot be implemented on near term devices. For protocol A, the main bottleneck is that you need to uh, evaluate the function f. And evaluating it is actually very hard because you need to have sufficiently large quantum memory and you need to have sufficient depth to implement it. So one direction is try to, you know, try to minimize the need for the ratio. And if we can minimize to a level that we can implement data on near term devices, then we can actually run these protocols on near term devices to help us to certify the depths. And the third open question is that, so here we talk about protocols, but actually what we want, what we may, what we may want is actually a problem. For example, Charles, Charles Edwardson can solve like the factoring problem. So factoring problem, you can just view it as a good candidate to separate quantum computer and the classical computer. And you also have a very significant real world application, right? Break all the crypto system. But here, if you want to say about a hybrid quantum classical computer, we actually, we haven't had such a you know, good candidate. We don't have a problem that has real world application and they can separate quantum computer with different depths. If we can have such problem, we can say, okay, you need to try to build a quantum computer to these steps, such that you can implement it. You can implement algorithm for this problem, such that you can have some good real world application. We haven't had that kind of problem right now, and I think this is a very important uh, problem, uh, you know, in theory and also in practice. Yeah. So that's all the open question I want to mention about this. Of course, there are some other open questions, kind of like. Uh, use different assumptions or like use different way to prove the quantum depths. But I mean, the main direction you, I, I'm trying to do is that, oh, like these three, like three questions. Okay.
And that's all for my talk today. Yeah, thank you.